terribly keen on promoting anything that makes it look bad or weak or defenseless or that they're lying or, you know. But in this case, they cooperated on this documentary, every element of the, um, of the armed services, uh, documentary makers coming into the corridors of power in the Pentagon. Some footage ended up in the, uh, in the final documentary of, uh, of a glowing ball over the uh, edge of the desert. Um, you know, a lot of strange stuff about that. I don't think it's, it's really hard to um, come to a conclusion about exactly what the, what the purpose was. Well, um, yeah, that, and that, that case seems to be one of several uh, over 20 or 30 years where uh, we've reported on this a number of times on the show, and our, our, our good friend uh, Greg Bishop has written uh, about this kind of in his book, Project Beta. He's also interviewed Emmenager, and over and over again from Jacques Vallée and J. Allen Hynek to Linda Moulton Howe uh, to uh, Robert Emmenager, all these people on separate projects, that's three projects right there that I'm aware of, were basically dangled a, a virtual carrot that was allegedly, you know, irrefutable evidence of UFOs as extraterrestrial uh, visitors. Uh, supposed footage that the military had was dangled in front of them as, as a carrot and uh, always snatched away and whether it even existed uh, in in the form of, it was claimed to is, is, is up for doubts. But like with it, but as far as the Michael Bay thing, it's to me, I mean, every time, every movie of his I've ever seen, the, the thing that goes through my mind is, wow, state-of-the-art military industrial entertainment complex. This guy just loves to bend over and take it from the military because he's, well, as Bill Hicks would say, sucking Satan's cock. Uh, you know, <laughs> this guy, you know, says he wants to make, you know, uh, movies about how great our guys are and how great, you know, a job we do. And I think you even comment on, uh, you quote, uh, a different Greg Bishop, Army Lieutenant Colonel Greg Bishop, uh, uh, from the I think the DVD commentary of Transformers, talking about what a great you know spectacle this was and what a great uh, advertisement it was for the military. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, the things like Transformers are great adverts for the military, and and I'm sure that they will um, have a great effect on recruitment as they uh, uh, as they always state that they will, and um, I'm sure they succeed. Well, and of course, uh, I was recently reminded you, you make an appearance in a uh, Al Jazeera uh, episode of Empire, uh, a TV video um, show. Uh, it's really good. And of course, as soon as I saw it, I thought, my God, this is completely inspired by uh, the book Real Power. And uh, they actually interviewed you in there. And to, to me, the whole thing from beginning to end seems like it was obviously uh, somebody read your book and said, yeah, let's do a whole segment on this. And they, instead of just alluding to you know michael moore and uh, oliver stone and others they actually get them in there but um in that film there's actually i think footage of this this uh, lieutenant colonel greg bishop uh but it reminded me of something i'd forgotten which was that as far back as top gun uh there were recruitment booths for the military in the lobbies of these theaters where top gun was was showing mm. and it was a huge yeah. boost in recruitment wow. yeah yeah i mean that, that was the that's the purpose of uh, the primary purpose is to is to generate recruitment. Uh, because, you know, bear in mind, most people who go to the cinema are kind of, you know, the 15 to 24-year-old, um, you know, perfect recruitment age um, for the armed services. So, I mean, that's the ostensible purpose. And, yeah, I mean, if you, if you believe in, um, you know, what the uh, American military is doing overseas, then, you know, that's not such a bad thing. You know, you need people to be in the army and in the Air Force and, in the Navy, and uh, okay, that, that's fine. One of the problems with it, though, is that, of course, you know, the, the, there's a political price to be paid, which is, first of all, you end up having a very, very large, very, very powerful entity within government censoring film scripts, and that just in itself is should be disturbing to anyone interested in democracy. And the other thing is you end up getting these... Uh, uh, you know w whether it's the primary concern or not of the um, uh, of the Department of Defense. You know they're going to have an impact on the kind of history that we are consuming and the kind of ideas that we are consuming um, about the way that the world works, and you end up getting a sanitized image of of history and of uh, American power, which is extremely dangerous. You know, I'm wondering what the solution or the antidote might be to all these uh, uh, th this, these big budget uh, propaganda blockbusters. Uh, and um, you talk in your uh, book about Oliver Stone and how uh, since JFK 
his films haven't been nearly as uh, uh, critical of the government as they might be. Uh, and in the case of World Trade Center, uh, you have to wonder what happened. Uh, I, I think he was even talking about, uh, uh, you know, possibly making a film about terrorism and telling the truth about inside jobs and so forth. And that hasn't happened. But he's also at the same time, uh, Oliver Stone, uh, that he's made these uh, uh, films like W, which uh, was supposed to be a really hard hitting film about uh, George W. Bush and wasn't quite as hard hitting as it could have been. But he's been making these low-budget uh, documentaries. Is that the uh, possible solution here? Is just more low-budget film? Well, I mean, the, yeah. One of the things about the uh, power of the internet, of course, is that you know if you want to find films, at least documentaries about subversive material, then you know that's not going to be difficult. You're going to be able to uh, Google that, YouTube that. So you know the information is out there. But, you know, how are they going to get the distribution aside from through the web? So, I mean, I think maybe it sounds a little bit glib, but I mean, my view is the solution is to you know, stop creating lies within big budget films. You know, I've got no objection to big budget films. I've got no objection to, um, you know, car chases and then explosions and all whatever, you know. But, um, you know, this kind of uh, it's the sort of self-censorship and the um, overt censorship that's uh, reworking. Uh, American history and you know, kind of creating a pretty solipsistic kind of kind of worldview. Mm -hmm. In in the book, you do cover you know uh, you have a section on on low lower budget films, and I think that it is really true. Uh, yeah, maybe I should highlight that. The, you know, it's not necessarily such a good thing. Low budget films are not necessarily the solution um, because many low budget films are still present very sort of uh, offensive views of. Mm -hmm. uh, American power, you know, and often they are still affected by the uh, by the powers that be. Um, but say you're looking at a budget of less than thirty million, um, there are some really good um, products within that. Or when I say good, I mean you know films that are uh, kind of away from their kind of mainstream ideology. Films like say Rendition, um, Embedded, a couple of brilliant British comedies. One called In the Loop by Armando Iannucci. Um, about the American uh, uh, sort of American political system, great piece of satire, and another one by um, an old colleague of uh, Ian Ucci's called Chris Morris, um, and he uh, did a film called Four Lions, which was about British terrorism, but um, kind of presenting British terrorists as quite <laughs> well. It was very funny, it was very dark, um, and it was presenting um, British terrorists as basically bungling. Idiotic <laughs> sort of fools, you know, really well-meaning, idiotic, ideologically driven Burks, mm -hmm. and I thought quite an effective film, which is kind of challenging, you know, commonly held assumptions in a way that's you know effective and you know, I guess useful. Uh, but you know, if you are low budget, you're not necessarily going to escape the effect of various power systems. You know, films like Buffalo Soldiers, for instance, which. I was delayed for a couple of years um, because of 9-11. Um, same thing with um, The Quiet American uh, from 2002 with Michael Caine. I mean, they managed to get that release for like two weeks in New York and L.A., um, but that was about it, even though it was a critically very well-acclaimed film. Um, and then, you know, often you've got other... Well, Fahrenheit 9-11, another great example of um, uh, a low-budget film that was, you know, really screwed by its own distributor. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you've got other movies uh, within that within that frame, you know, that are lower budget, that are not necessarily um, a lot of John claude Van Damme type of thing. Yeah. Um, and then films like United 93, Hotel Rwanda, Home of the Brave. Goodness, I'm just looking through my own notes here. Um, Air Marshal. Oh my God, that was awful. <laughs> that, was the, that, was the, that was the film that um, that was the film that spelled Libya wrong. <laughs> you know, you, when you open the film in the first twenty seconds, you spell the name of the co of the country that you're that you're setting it in, and you know that's a sign of, of some contempt, I think, for well, <laughs> Obama's for, uh, sort of, Twitter account yeah. recently misspelled Libya. So there you go. <laughs> there can be the assumption that if you're criticizing sort of big budget, rah rah, pro military films, that maybe this means that the person who's criticizing, whether that's me or uh, anybody else prefer to have art house movies, you know, mm -hmm. kind of promoted. But that's not really my 
agenda at all. I just think that uh, films shouldn't present favourable mythology for the American government. I just think films should be honest where they can be. Mm-hmm. Um, if people want to make art house films, if people want to make small budget documentaries or small budget films, and that's all great. If you want to make big budget, that's great. But do it with a sense of social responsibility. That doesn't necessarily mean pushing some kind of agenda, whether that's an agenda for, you know, race equality or some left wing thing or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that's necessary. But I think it is necessary to stop films and criticize films, interrogate them, you know, if they are presenting lies or an image of controversial matters in terms of foreign policy, which would otherwise be up in arms about, but just because it's a film, we, we may be uh, uh, less tough on uh, on that because we say, oh, it's just entertainment. So I mean, that's kind of where, where I'm coming from. Mm-hmm. Um, the point I was going to say about the, um, the point I wanted to raise about uh, advisors, which I think is one way of, of making uh, some difference to films. Um, so you look at a film like um, Three Kings, for instance, from 1999, which in certain ways does still support kind of American cliches, American exceptionalism and all that, yeah. um, in that it shows the George Clooney character in Iraq kind of sorting things out. But, you know, it was an intelligent film and it was um, one that raised issues about what the role of West was in, uh, in the Persian Gulf War. And uh, one of the reasons that it was a good film, but in terms of entertainment and politically uh, had a social conscience, is because they had a guy advising on a film called Jack Shaheen who um, makes it his business, really, to look at racist depictions, of, uh, particularly of Arabs and Muslims, in, uh, in movies over the past century, uh, over the past hundred years. Um, and he's done an incredible body of work pointing to the, uh, the, long, uh, the long-established uh, stereotype of evil Arab terrorists. And um, he worked on the film, and the, uh, and the producers and directors were, were very happy to work with him, and they turned what was looked to be a pretty naff, script and very uh, edifying piece of work into something that was critically acclaimed and, you know, really, really good. Mm-hmm. Um, and the same thing happened on, um, on Syriana um, in 2005, although my personal um, preference was definitely Three Kings. Of, uh, Syriana was quite, um, you know, not terribly entertaining. But, you know, the, uh, Jack worked on that, uh, on that movie as well. So if you have got studios who are willing to, to work with people who have a social conscience, almost like corporations farming out, <laughs> outsourcing to have a conscience, um, then, you know, that can be effective um, in, in creating better entertainment and things that are more appropriate. But then, you know, th- the flip side of it, of it is, you know, if you don't do that, then you end up with uh, films like From Paris with Love, <laughs> John Travolta, which is just the most hilariously offensive film I've seen in a long time. <laughs> Going back briefly to the science fiction issue, you end your chapter uh, on science fiction films, uh, interestingly, citing uh, Susan Sontag's 1974 essay, and that describes uh, science fiction's hunger for a good war which poses no moral problems and fought against monstrous enemies that, quote, provide a fantasy target for righteous bellicosity. Something that uh, we've talked to uh, our mutual acquaintance, uh, Mark Pilkington, about is this recurring theme uh, since the 40s in both political circles and within fictional storytelling of the idea of uniting humanity against a common external foe. Mm -hmm. And certainly, of course, the earliest book I'm aware of is the 1950 book, The Flying Saucer by Bernard Newman, uh, where a group of scientists decide to fake a, uh, an alien invasion or an external a counterfeit foe, a, a false flag of sorts, to unite humanity against this alien other. This idea has obviously found a lot of traction in the conspiracy community and even the conspiracy element of the UFO community. Have you found other examples of agendas besides just recruitment and uh, mythologizing the benevolence of American power what other agendas, if any, have you seen at work behind the scenes uh, on the, by the hand of uh, the military-industrial complex? Uh, well, it's, it's hard to know uh, all the details because a lot of this is now in the public domain. The Department of Defense does provide quite a lot of their annotated scripts to a library, and that you know, has kind of been picked up by one or two researchers. 
And the stuff about CIA is, you know, no one, you know, there's just nothing written down. 